Well, this is going to be fun when I try the second game then. Um, okay. So let's have a quick debrief on the dictator game. Um, does anybody want to volunteer what uh, you agreed, what you had there? Let's, let's get uh, Alexi. Uh, we both would have given each other 50. 50, $50 okay. Dollars, yeah. Okay. And there, is the reason also important or so yeah, give, I, you can give the reason. Well, basically we're just, the reason was, you know, if I would have been given the hundred dollars, uh, it's not that the hundred dollars were a result of my work. I just got them. Yeah. So why would I, why would I keep them if I can share them with someone but who remember, I would have also benefited from it? If you're a traditional economist, you're trying to maximize your utility. So a traditional economist would have given 90, would have given $1 and kept 99 because then you get 99 and you maximize your own utility. But what you're basically saying is you care about the well-being of the other person. And that, I believe, is in accord with human nature. Anybody else? Any other groups? Um, Jack? I was with Hannah, and she, she gave the 50-50. I, I was more in the like 60, 40 boat. Cause if I have the a hundred dollars, you know, I want to be generous, but I still kind of want to retain that slight edge. So. Well, I, that's I, interesting because in the U S if you look at the, U, the, the U S average is 40%. So you would fit right in the U S average uh, in terms of what you would give. Yeah. And I think for, for the, for the reason too, you know, there's, there is a mixture of different human motivations going on. So, you know, you want, you care about the well-being of the other, but you also care about your own well-being. So that's, that's very interesting. Anybody else? Anybody else not give, anybody not give 50-50? Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, Jim, um, J who is it, James or Jim? Uh, James, James and Barbara. Um, <laughs> and, um, uh, we, we did two versions. We did the version with no parameters, which, which was if, if I get a hundred dollars and I don't give her anything, I still get to keep the hundred dollars. I would keep the hundred dollars. But if, if I gave, if I had a hundred dollars and I wouldn't get anything unless I shared it, then I would probably no, 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 but, you're, you're jump, but you're jumping ahead. That's the ultimatum game. We're going to do that next. But, uh, I, I, yes. Can I can I jump in here? Yes. yes. I, I didn't know the rules of the game, so I thought, oh. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, no, okay. So hold on for that for a minute. But in this game, you guys basically gave you you kept everything, James, right? Yes. You kept and, everything. And she said that was very masculine, and she gave me fifty fifty, which she said was well, very dominant. <laughs> so we're seeing divi I'm seeing two two dimensions of division here. I'm going to be a little controversial. I'm seeing a division across some division, maybe across gender, but also division across age, maybe. Anybody else? Anybody else want to comment on that? Okay. Maybe I'm being too controversial. Older people have more to give. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Okay. Let's do one more thing. And I'm going, I, 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 uh, if I end the Zoom meeting again, just pop back in, but I'm going to try and not do it this time. So this time we're going to do the ultimatum game. Same rules, except this time player two gets to say yes or no. If you say yes, then whatever player one proposes is, the, is done. It's a done deal. If you say no, both end up with zero. Both walk away with zero. Does everybody understand the rules of the ultimatum game? So player two now has agency. If you don't like the division proposed by player one, you say no, and you both get zero. So that changes things a lot. Let's see. So let's, let's, I'm going to break, I'm going to create the breakout rooms again. And let's, let's just, um, okay, let me just do this.
Okay, ultimatum game, go. Did I get put in a room? I told it, yeah, because I had an even number. Did oh, I? I, I might have accidentally rejected it when I was trying to close out of something else. I put, let me see. Did I put you in a room with a student? Because then the student will be on their own. Uh, I put you in with James Stoner. All right, I'll go back. Okay, people are trickling back in. So I managed to do it this time without bumping you all out. So that's, so I'm learning. I'll just give it a couple of minutes because I think some people are trickling back in. This is one of the very few advantages of Zoom where you can do think you can play these kind of games very simply by creating breakout rooms. Um, normally, I'm not a fan of Zoom for teaching, but uh, I think this kind of thing works. Okay, people are all back. Very good. So, ultimatum game. Anybody want to volunteer what you agreed to divide at this time? Uh, yes, Catherine. Uh, well, Alexios and I. Um, we, when we played the dictator game together, we both did 50, 50. And then when we played this game together, we also both did 50, 50. And the reason we did that is first of all, because it was, it seems fair. Yeah. Um, and that's just the mind, like immediately where my brain goes. Um, but secondly, because there's really no, you know, when I have the power and I give him 50, 50, there's no reason for him to, when he has the power, like not like pay that over. So like, yeah we were even talking about how like maybe in the first game you'd want to do like 60 for your opponent or not for your other player and 40 for you um, just to like get them in the nice headspace of like, okay, well I'll give back as well. So it was just interesting. That's great because what you've just basically argued is that uh, fairness breeds trust. So yeah, you, 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 you created because I accident, I didn't mean to put you both in the same group twice, but because I did, you developed the trust and that kind of mirrors the way things work in society, I think, when you develop trust between people. Anybody else? Uh, my partner and I uh, played the game uh, three times, in effect. The first round, we played it by accident. We played the old ultimatum game. And one part, one person said 15, the other person accepted it, playing the ultimate game by mistake. And then this, that, that person, the other person said 45, and it got rejected. Wow. That was earlier. Now, on this round, uh, one person offered 50, and it was accepted, and the other person offered 49. And the partner kind of hesitated and finally said yes. And then the person who offered 49 backed off and said 50 after all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Very interesting. Very interesting. So toying around with to see what you can get away with. Anybody else? Did anybody not offer 50-50? Everybody I, offered 50-50. I, I didn't. I offered uh, 30. And uh, that was because my partner previously had kept 100%. Ah, so I, okay. You're, 
we're you're, doing reverse trust here. Okay, reverse. That's very okay. interesting because we're, I'm going to talk about that in a second. Okay, so let's um, let me jump into sharing my uh, screen with you. And we, oh, uh, sorry, somebody had raised their hand. Uh, Juliana. Oh yeah, um, I just wanted to note that I had started with the ultimate game and offered sixty forty, and my partner offered twenty five to me and kept seventy five. And then when we get got to the ultimatum game, um, he proposed 55, 45 off the bat, and I stuck with 60, 40. Okay. So that, like, did, covering... but, when, but when he proposed 55, 45, did you accept it? Yes. Yes, yes you did. Okay. I think the, the evidence seemed to suggest that people, once, you, once you start getting down to 20 or 30, people, start reje people reject it very strongly. Um, because remember, you're playing with you're playing with imaginary money. They do it. They do this games with real money. And some people might say, well, if you're offering me 40, you know, I'd rather 50 and I'm a bit annoyed with you, a bit pissed off with you actually, but I'm still going to take 40 because it's better than nothing. So yeah. Well, once you get down to 20, people will say, well, I'm really annoyed now. That's you're really trying to screw me over here. That's uh, that's just too much. Okay. Let me share the screen. And, uh, And put this up. And I want, let's just go back a second. I think playing the dictator and ultimatum games, I think we found out and you have found out that people don't behave like economists. They actually cooperate. What did you find? Well, we talked about what you found. Now, I wanted to read this quote by... There's, a, there's an economist called Samuel Bowles, and he works a lot on these kind of trust and e economic games and how you develop trust among uh, participants. And he's written a wonderful book called The Moral Economy, which is very related to uh, what we're doing here. But he defines something called strong reciprocity. And I'm just going to quote him because strong because I think it's very relevant to what you just did. He says, strong reciprocity is the propensity to cooperate and share with others similarly disposed, even at a personal cost, and a willingness to punish those who violate cooperative and other social norms, even when punishing is personally costly and cannot be expected to result in net personal gains in the future. To simplify that, if the other person cooperates and shares, you are willing to cooperate and share. But if the other person is not willing and tries to cheat you, then you will get annoyed and you will try and punish them by, by in the ultimatum game, you punish them by walking away and you're willing to give up and you're, you're willing to walk away with, not, with nothing just to punish the person because this inbuilt, inbuilt sense of fairness is so strong that you actually will be willing to walk away rather than... Uh, Take, a, a, take an outcome that you deem to be unfair. Um, okay, that is to play those two different games. Let's talk about where all this, let's go further. Let's go further into what Professor Sachs was talking about. Um, so clearly there, is, there are strong altruistic traits in human nature. And our old friend, Adam Smith, who in the Wealth of Nations said that uh, economics is about self-interest. He actually, in his book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments, said something very different. And I think, and we've seen this quote before, but I think it's very relevant here uh, when we talk about altruism. He said, however selfish, how selfish soever man may be supposed, I don't like man, but let's say human beings may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his or her nature which interest him or her in the fortune of others and render their happiness necessary to him or her, though he or she derives nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. You derive nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. That's altruism uh, there. Now, there are two types of altruism. There is like, uh, we call it empathy and compassion. Um, 
and this uh, you can there's, there's a very big uh, there's a book by a, a French Buddhist monk called Matthew Ricard called Altruism it's which is he's both um, a Buddhist monk and a scientist so he knows all the science he wrote this brilliant book it's very long um, maybe there's something about French authors writing very long books but uh, it's about 900 pages so we're not assigning it for the course, but it's, if you're interested in it, it's a very interesting book. And, and he distinguishes between empathy and compassion. Empathy is basically emotional resonance. It's putting yourself in another person's shoes, feeling their joy with them, feeling their suffering with them. That's empathy, putting yourself in the other person's shoes. But compassion is stronger than empathy. Compassion is actually help acting to help another and alleviate suffering. So you can have empathy and do nothing about it. But compassion is actually doing something about the misfortune you see in others and helping them. Um, there is such a thing as empathy fatigue. In other words, you, if you're a very empathetic person and the pain of others is so strong that it basically wears you down and you find yourself immobilized and incapable of doing something to alleviate the pain you feel. Whereas there's no such thing as compassion fatigue because compassion is basically helping others. Uh, so that's why, there's a, that's why some psychologists argue that like Paul Bloom from Yale, for example, argues that empathy is overrated because empathy can result in you doing nothing. Whereas compassion, you do something. Um, remember in economics, we had the utility functions. Um, it's possible to put empathy or something like empathy in a utility function. In other words, I care about your well being. Um, but is it really possible to put compassion in a utility function? Are you willing to? help somebody else even at a cost to yourself that's much 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 harder case to make now these altruistic traits uh, we can see this in both animals and in young children and professor Sachs already showed you a little clip of uh, of, of, of animals uh, but that was an experiment about fairness Animals and children, by the way, um, do not like unfairness and they react very viscerally to unfairness, kind of like you did during the ultimatum game. Um, but what does the animals, the, we, we know that animals can come to the aid of each other. They rescue the other animals from danger. They can experience empathy with them. They can console them when they suffer and they mourn them when they die. Um, a classic example here is elephants. Like elephants are very social, very intelligent animals. Uh, and they, they, you, they, they, they will console other elements and they mourn um, their kin when they die. Uh, so there are, there are altruistic traits within animals. They're, they also reject unfair payoffs as we saw with the monkeys. Um, also in children, children are ready to help from the earliest age. They have altruistic tendencies. And they also, as any of you, maybe you have, uh, maybe you remember it from your own childhood or you have younger brothers and sisters, they have a strong equality bias. Nothing upsets a child more than thinking that their parent favors their sibling over them, getting, more, getting less candy than their, than their brother or sister. Uh, that's something that really is considered a major injustice for a young child. Uh, they react very viscerally against that, as you probably know. Let me show you something. Um, since Professor Sachs showed you a video, I want to see if I can, if I have this video here. This is called toddler altruism. I'm going to play it.
that's cute, right? Um, what we saw there was basically, let me reshare my, let me, let me put my screen back up. What we saw there in that little video was a toddler helping an adult that they saw was in need. Obviously the toddler did it instinctively um, because there is an innate tendency for altruism in young children. Now, let me do this. There's a book that was written just last year by a, a doctor called Nicholas Christicki. It's called The Social Blueprint. It's called Blueprint, and it's about how we are social animals. And he comes up with, and, if, and, and those of you who are interested in this can look up this book. It's called Blueprint. It's, it's very interesting. Again, didn't put it in the reading list because it's a long, it's, 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 it go, it's a bit of a detour from what we're doing here in terms of economics. But he talks about the, what he calls the social suite and which defines the, 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 the traits of being a human being. Um, and he, he, he isolates, I think, six of them. One is love for partners and children. So basically altruism begins at home with your partner and with your children. The importance of friendship. Um, happy, uh, we are social animals. Aristotle said we can't be happy without friends. The modern science, the modern neuroscience, the modern psychology um, also says the same thing, that friendship is extremely important to us as human beings. And we care not only about our partners and our children, but we care about the well-being of our friends. Going one step broader than that is the central role played by cooperative social networks. So we cooperate in groups in small groups and in larger groups. We are willing to cooperate and think about the various games we played, Prisoner's Dilemma, Dictator Game, Ultimatum Game, Trust Game, Public Goods Game, the various games you played with that Professor Sachs described and we talked about this morning. Um, they show that you cooperate in various social networks. Uh, two people, more than two people, small groups, large groups. But there is a dark side to the social suite. And that dark side is that we tend to have preferences for one's own group, uh, insiders versus outsiders. And you can prime this behavior very simply. Like there was one experiment where I think at a children's camp, they basically divided the kids into two different groups, one with red t-shirts and one with blue t-shirts. And they had them do a bunch of competitive activities and pretty soon um, even though the divisions of into red and blue and blue t-shirts were random the kids started identifying very strongly with my group my team my red team my blue team and demonizing the other group the other group are a bunch of cheats they're not as good as we are you know they deserve to lose uh, it, it's very easy to prime human beings into preferring your own group. And this can have very, very dangerous consequences when it gets into things like xenophobia and hatred of foreigners and, um, and can even, and uh, all incidents of genocide in history start with demonizing outside groups and preferring the purity of your own group or your own race or whatever it is. That's a really dark side of the social suite. And, um, but it, it's also within, just like selfishness is within human nature, this preferences for one's own is also within human nature. The next one is a sense of fairness and egalitarianism. We've seen that. Don't need to talk about more about that because we've already seen this in the games we played um, that you all value fairness. You, you've, in your, in your answers, you already said this. You value fairness, you value egalitarianism. So think about this, keep this in mind for when we do the class on inequality uh, somewhat down the road in our course. Um, if a society is very unequal, you will get a lot of, um, you will get a lot of uh, anxiety, you will get a lot of um, uh, frustration, 
because people are fundamentally believe in fairness. And if they think somebody else has got their income or wealth unfairly, um, if uh, Jeff Bezos deserved $200 billion or whatever he earns while uh, 700 million people live in extreme poverty, you know, that can really resonate as deeply unfair uh, in the modern economy. So keep that in mind when we get there, that this is part of, uh, of, our, of the human being as well. And finally, the prevalence of social learning and teaching. You know, this is all about, um, we, as Aristotle said, we learn from our teachers and from our role models, and we, we can learn how to be ethical and uh, moral uh, individuals. Okay, that's Chris Dickis' social suite. Now, where does this come from? This is coming from evolution, um, as, uh, as, as people say. I mean, if it's coming, if you see it in animals and you see it in young babies, then altruism has to somehow come from evolution. Uh, and this, and there are a number, there are a large number of different theories as to why this happens. Uh, I'll briefly talk about four of the, of the, um, of the most popular ones. Um, the first one is kin selection. And kin selection is basically saying that, well, the genes survive and reproduce when other people who bear that same gene survive and reproduce. Therefore, you want to make sure your relatives thrive and do well because the gene survives and propagates not only by you, the bearer surviving, but by close relatives surviving. This was popularized by uh, uh, an evolutionary biologist called Richard Dawkins uh, in a book he wrote called The Selfish Gene back in the 1970s. And the title is a bit of a misnomer because it's not about selfishness, it's actually about altruism. Because you care about your kin surviving, you're altruistic toward your kin. Well, the problem with this is it explains why you're altruistic towards your relatives, but it doesn't explain why you're, rel you're, you're, sorry, you're altruistic towards strangers. Um, and so we need other theories to explain that. And one is reciprocal altruism, which comes in a direct and an indirect form. So direct reciprocal altruism, basically think of the kind of small games you just played. It's repeated interactions among small groups of people. And if you are in a small group and you're playing games with the same people over and over again, if you're interacting with them, then you will either build up trust or you will build up mistrust. So if you are nice to me, I will be nice to you. If you try to pull a fast one on me, I'll punish you for it. And you get cooperation by playing over and over again. And this can explain cooperation within small groups. Think of our, of our evolutionary history, where for most of, most of our 250,000 years of human existence, we, as human beings, we lived in small bands of hunter-gatherers with maybe 25 people uh, maximum. So you knew everybody really well you interacted with them on a daily basis and you were able to build up trust by repeatedly playing this game over and over again. But again, the problem with that, just like with kin selection, is it can be very narrow. This explains altruism within your small group. But what about outside your small group? What about within larger groups? And this is where indirect reciprocal altruism comes in. Indirect reciprocal altruism is about the power of reputation within a community. And it allows for a wider range of people to interact with and to uh, play games with, as it were. And so basically, you build by being a good player and by trusting and cooperating and by being altruistic, you develop a good reputation for yourself. So you do something good, not just to get something good in return, but to build a good reputation. And that in turn boosts the chance of somebody doing you a good turn somewhere down the line. So it's about reputation. And by the way, this again goes back 
to Adam Smith. Adam Smith talk, t- thought that our, the empathy that we feel for each other manifests in a desire to build a good reputation. And when everybody has, when we have good reputations, we do good and people will do good to us and you build up trust, you build up social cohesion and social capital. So that's indirect reciprocal altruism. The final theory, which I think is uh, the most convincing is called multi-level selection. And I think that that basically says that you have, let's say you have two types of people. You have selfish people who try to pull a fast one on everybody else and get a benefit for themselves. And you have altruistic people who want to cooperate. Well, who wins within a small group? Let's say you have a bunch of cooperators, but you have one person who is willing to cheat. Well, that person might might win out because they play up, they play on the naivete, on the gullibility of the other members of the group, uh, because the other members of the group are very naive. They think everybody's like them and wants to cooperate. So you might say in a small group, the the, the non-cooperative person wins and his or her genes can propagate and you will get through by evolution, you will get a whole bunch of selfish people. But that's not what happens because there's a second level of, of, of selection, of evolutionary selection, and that's at the group level. So if selfish members win within groups, groups of altruists beat groups of selfish people. So let's assume that you have a bunch of small groups and you face threats. You face threats of environmental stress, climate change. You face uh, harsh conditions. You face threats from other groups of uh, war, of uh, conflict. Well, which groups are most likely to survive? And the answer there is, it's the groups that are best at cooperating. Because if you can cooperate as a group, you can, you can hone your resources and you can bring out the best in everybody else. Whereas the group of selfish people will not be able to come together on a common strategy to overcome the external challenge. So we say that, that um, this can explain cooperation among larger groups than other theories. And again, it goes back to our 250,000 years of uh, human existence. Um, If we have um, human existence, because we have um, um, small bands of hunter-gatherers who did indeed face uh, environmental stress and who did indeed face conflict from other groups over resources and and other things. Uh, Of course, this also can explain what I termed the dark side of the social suite, because why are you, you co-op, you're cooperating within your group, but you're doing that so you can beat the other group. So it's again, the insider outsider approach to human nature comes out very clearly in multi-level selection. Uh, and again, that's, there's a dark side there and we have to keep that in mind and remember If you believe Aristotle and virtue ethics, then all these dark elements of human nature, selfishness, preference for your own tendency to demonize the other, you have to use practical reason. You have to develop the virtues to be a more virtuous person, to overcome these negative traits, which come from our, basically our animal heritage. Um, So evolution provides a basis for altruism but it also can provide the basis for more darker human instincts. Um, The neuroscience, as Professor Sachs mentioned, uh, just to do, also shows very clearly that um, we are, we have altruistic traits. There are two parts to the brain. Uh, The oldest, most ancient part is the limbic system, which regulates our emotions. And the newest part of the brain is the prefrontal cortex, which regulates our executive, our higher executive functions, like delayed gratification, long-term planning, 
the reining in of impulses and addictions, the regulation of emotions, um, whereas the limbic system is really all about emotion. A key part there is called the amygdala, which regulates fear, anxiety, anger, uh, aggression. Um, so when you feel cheated in economic games, by the way, it's your amygdala that's firing. Uh, you, you, it's a very strong emotional response uh, to being cheated. Uh, it's not your rational part of your brain. Uh, so that's a very interesting. And of course, the prefrontal cortex uh, makes you do the harder thing uh, when, even when it's the right thing. So delaying your gratification, um, uh, calming your uh, negative emotions, calming your desire to punish and be aggressive, um, uh, reining in harmful impulses. By the way, the, the, the prefrontal cortex is underdeveloped in children and teenagers, which can explain why children and teenagers tend to make decisions that are often um, not, uh, that can be harmful for themselves, like doing high risk activities, um, caring only about themselves, uh, you know, th things like this. Um, there's a very good book uh, that I like by a professor called uh, Robert Sapolsky called Behave. It's a very nice book about, the, uh, about human psychology. And he's also very funny. And, uh, and the chapter on, on the development of the prefrontal cortex among children and teenagers is called, Dude, Where's My Prefrontal Cortex? So uh, I just thought that was a funny title for a chapter. I, I had a chuckle at that. Um, so also the emotional center makes us pro-social towards in-groups, but it's the cognitive center, the prefrontal cortex in particular, that inclines us towards pro-sociality, towards out-groups. So again, neuroscience is basically cohering with what Aristotle said all those uh, millennia ago, that we have to use our rationality to make the harder decision to be virtuous as opposed to giving in to our animal instincts. And one of those animal instincts means to prefer in-groups rather than, uh, than uh, outsiders. Uh, oxytocin is basically the hormone that promotes the bond between mother and child. Um, it, can, it inhibits the amygdala and suppresses fear and anxiety. And uh, as Professor Sachs mentioned, uh, giving somebody oxytocin makes you more trusting in economic games. It also makes you more charitable. So, you know, that's that at the hormonal level, we can also see um, the neuroscience giving evidence on the, the different aspects of human nature. Likewise, mirror neurons, this is just repeating what Professor Sachs says. These are neural pathways that react to the experience of others, allow you to take the perspective of others, feel their pain, and make an empathic connection. This is the neuroscientific roots of empathy. Um, but as I mentioned, empathy can be limited and paralyzing. You can have empathy fatigue. And it, so you need the prefrontal cortex to make the hard choice to turn empathy into compassion and to actually act to help people. Uh, so again, it's the rational part of your brain that actually helps people, that actually makes you, you turn your altruism into actually acting to help people. Um, what does neoclassical economics say? Well, it assumes that, as I mentioned before, and as, as, as Thomas Aquinas says, it assumes that people act on their desires and so are really more likely to act like on their animal nature than on their rational, uh, human, nature, rational human nature. Um, they're not using their prefrontal cortexes um, to make the harder choice of things like longer term planning and uh, uh, compassion, delayed gratification, reining in of, impu of, of, of impulses, uh, uh, becoming virtuous, all of those things. So that's, so I've given you some evidence from economic games, which we saw also with Professor Sachs. I've given you some evidence with um, uh, evolutionary science. 
and I've now given you some evidence on neuroscience that uh, the, the instincts that we learned from Aristotle onwards, Aquinas, Catholic social teaching, all show very clearly that we are social animals uh, who care about each other, who care about the well-being of each other. And this is affirmed by the latest science. So if that's the case, how do we invest in social capital? And I'm defining, and this is coming from Professor Sachs's paper, by the way, and I am defining um, social capital like Professor Sachs does as the social conditions that cause pro-sociality. How do you make people more pro-social? How do you bring out these pro-social traits? And how do you suppress these anti-social traits like selfishness and preferences for in-groups? Well, there's a whole lot of answers to that question, and I'll just touch on some of them. One is moral training and education. Remember Aristotle, that we learn, we become moral through practice, through training, through role models, through developing our kind of our moral muscle memory, that through practice we become better. But that requires uh, education in civic virtue, uh, which tends to be something that we don't emphasize in our current educational systems. Related to that, if you have universal access to education, you're more likely to have an educated citizenry, uh, more civic engagement, engagement, and more awareness of social dilemmas, the kind of social dilemmas that Professor Sachs talked about. Uh, the third point there is professional codes of ethics. Um, doctors have this, it's called the Hippocratic Oath. First, do no harm. The professional code of ethics, it stops antisocial behavior. Uh, there are plenty of groups that do not have this. For example, bankers. Bankers do not have a professional code of ethics that says, don't, um, don't do anything that harms your clients. Because during the global financial crisis, they did a lot of things that harmed their clients. So I think if you had professional codes of ethics, you could basically clamp down on some of the antisocial behavior. You can also just simply regulate antisocial behavior. And two glaring examples there would be pollution, regulate pollution and climate change, and financial fraud. Uh, proper regulation in those two areas um, would reduce a lot of antisocial behavior. Uh, likewise, reducing corruption among governments. Um, one reason why people lack trust in governments and in their fellow citizens is that there's a lot of corruption uh, in various countries, in a lot of countries. Um, if you tamp down on corruption, you restore and regain trust in governments to support the common good. Uh, narrowing income and wealth inequalities. Remember, inequality, and we'll discuss this much more in a later class, reduces trust and social cohesion and causes a lot of social and psychological problems because people are wired for fairness. And with inequality, you get a lot of unfairness and people react very negatively towards that and social capital and pro-social behavior are diminished. Recovery of moral discourse. Oh, sorry, universal social benefits with strong social safety nets. This is, um, you know, this is why countries like the Scandinavian countries have strong trust and social cohesion because people feel like when, they when they're in economic trouble, there's a helping hand there to help them out. And they're not stigmatized because the benefits are universal um, and uh, they, they're able to uh, survive and to thrive. And that creates more trust within society. Recovering of moral discourse, um, naming and shaming, naming and praising, um, basically bringing back a sense of a moral economy that as, as I mentioned, as Pope Benedict XVI says, every economic decision is a moral decision, but we've kind of lost the moral discourse. Um, I think if we talk more about the moral dimension of economic policymaking, 
we would be able to restore and develop stronger social capital and instill more pro-social behavior. And very quickly, strengthening deliberative democracy, which encourages civic engagement and a more accurate reporting of pro-social behavior. Uh, for example, there was this famous experiment, I think it was in Canada, whereas people dumped a bunch of wallets with a dress and, and the wallets had both money and um, identification with somebody's address in it. And, and they wanted to know, would people who found the wallets return the wallets? Well, it turned out that most wallets get returned with the money intact. And they were returned three, and, and they're returned three times as often as people would expect. So I think if you accurately report pro-social behavior, you will see, as you saw in your own experiments, that people are more pro-social than many people believe. I think we have been trained by maybe by economics in part to think that we are very selfish and that we're out for ourselves and we don't cooperate. Whereas in fact, people do cooperate. People want to cooperate. Uh, people do trust their neighbors and their, uh, their uh, fellow citizens uh, way more than is often thought. So there are just some ways of how to invest in social capital. Uh, before we end the class today, I want to do one more. Um, I want to talk about the civil economy paradigm, which is associated with a, a, a number of Italian economists, the three in particular, are the authors of that paper in the 2015 World Happiness Report I mentioned at the beginning of class. Uh, Stefano Zamani, uh, Luigino Bruni, and Leonardo Becchetti. And they form what's often called the civil economy paradigm uh, in economics. It's, very, it's a very Italian approach to economics. It's not very popular in the English speaking world. I think it should be because I think it's really about what economics would look like if you had stronger trust and stronger social capital, and in turn, how you structure your economy to make sure that you develop a stronger trust and stronger social capital. Well, the starting point is uh, Adam Smith versus Antonio Genovese. Antonio Genovese was an economist who was a contemporary of Adam Smith he lived in the late 18th century. And whereas Adam Smith talked about self-interest, I'll caveat that a bit, because as we saw earlier in class, Smith also talked about empathy. But in The Wealth of Nations, remember Smith said, um, it's only through the self-interest of the butcher and the baker and the brewer that you have your dinner, um, because uh, they do it to make money. And because of their self-interest, you get to eat a nice dinner. So it's self-interest. Whereas Genovese said, no human being, not, evil the, not even the most cruel and hardened can enjoy pleasures in which no one else participates. In other words, um, the civil economy paradigm sees human sociability and reciprocity as core elements of economic life. Uh, that is basically what the civil economy paradigm says. Um, the Italians will often go back to the, the tradition of civic humanism in the 15th century, which developed the Renaissance in Italy, uh, a, very, a, very, a very period of flowering period of human flourishing. Um, but the idea is basically quite simple. It's that human beings have shared needs that can only be satisfied through mutual assistance, not just self-interest, but mutual assistance. And you develop reciprocity. Remember I talked about reciprocity in last week's class? Um, reciprocity in Catholic social teaching is the idea that you do something to benefit the other, uh, not expecting you're gonna get anything in return, but in doing so, the blessing is often returned because um, you develop stronger trust, social capital, and you foster pro-social behavior. 
And gratuitous, again, is the idea that you do something to give a benefit to the other, not expecting anything in return. So it is the idea that you allow fraternity to be embedded in the economy and in market transactions. Um, so you give a benefit in the sense of foregoing a maximum benefit to yourself, knowing that such a blessing will eventually be returned. So this recognizes the fundamental importance of the relational life, the relational nature of the human being, the social animal nature of the human being for both personal and, and, um, and, um, uh, and sorry, social uh, flourishing. You care about the well-being of the person on the other side of the encounter. So market transactions are always mediated by interpersonal relationships. So the butcher and the baker and the brewer, it's not just that it's their self-interest that they make your dinner, it's that they care about you having the best uh, food and drink and enjoying a great dinner. And you, you produce this so that the other person at the other end of the encounter can, can be happy and can flourish and you care about their well-being and they in turn will care about you. That's how it works. Um, there's something called relational goods. Um, relational goods are alien to modern economics, uh, which only really looks at material goods. But relational goods basically say that these are goods that can only be enjoyed if shared reciprocally, are characterized by gratuitousness and where the source of the good lies in the relationship itself. So the relationship is the good. So you in, the, in economic life develop a relationship with the person at the other side of the economic transaction. And you both care about the well-being of each other and you foster each other's good. That's the relation, a relational good. And again, if you go to that chapter in the World Happiness Report by Zamani, Bruni, and Becchetti, they will talk about what relational goods are, and they talk more generally about the civil economy paradigm. Um, a lot of this material is not the easiest to read because it's translated from Italian into English, so it's a, it can be a little clunky. But this chapter in the World Happiness Report, I think, is, is, very, is very good and very clear uh, by those three authors. Um, let me talk a little, as I wind, as I wound, as I, uh, wound, wind up here, about Luigino Bruni, one of the three authors of that essay I mentioned, and one of the architects of the civil economy paradigm, wrote a really interesting short book called The Wound and the Blessing. And I think that this is, um, and he argued that where did Adam Smith go wrong? Why did Adam Smith basically say, well, Adam Smith basically says you want, he was reacting to the circumstances of the day where you had a lot of corruption you had a lot of favoritism. Um, the, the monarchs were basically giving licenses and monopolies to their cronies and their friends. Um, you had a lot of monopolies. So Smith hated all this. He thought that this was corrupting. Uh, it was unfair. It also led to bad economic outcomes because when you suppress competition, Smith argued, you suppress overall wealth. So Smith basically says, you need to get rid of this whole corruption by having one, two things. One, self-interested motivation, and two, an impersonal exchange in the marketplace, impersonal. Um, therefore, you just, you know, it becomes almost mechanical. Um, Bruni argues that Smith in doing that, while we understand why he went there because of all the corruption that was taking place at his time, he threw out the baby with the bad water because he basically conceived of the market as a relationship-free zone. 
and it just, yeah, they're just through relationships that we build trust and social capital and the basis of the good life. So he threw the baby out with the bad water, with the bath water. Whereas in actual fact, if you expose yourself to the wounds of, of, of going onto the market, if you go to the market, if you, if you deal with somebody, if you, if you form an economic relationship with a counterpart, you could be wounded, you could be cheated. We know this, you've played the games, you could be cheated, um, you could be treated unfairly, but if you hide from that, you miss the chance to achieve the blessing. In other words, the relational um, uh, flourishing with the other to achieve your mutual well-being and to develop these all-important um, relational goods. So the civil economy builds trust and social capital because it's a complex mix of self-interested and, and concern for the other's well-being. So again, just to sum it up, it's the idea that people, you can pursue profits for yourself and give a social benefit to the other at the same time. So the baker makes bread to give a good a gift to the person who's buying and eating the bread. Profit is a legitimate side effect, but in the civil economy paradigm, it's not the only motivating factor. You care about the person on the other end of the transaction. Now, so this uh, gives rise to, there are many practical examples of how you can have this kind of civil economy. Um, for example, you can have cooperatives whereby uh, the workers actually own the business and derive the profits from it. There you have, it's a very relational economy because you're all benefiting uh, at the same time. Um, you can have... Uh, like credit unions or build mutual aid societies, whereby instead of going to a bank, everybody pools their money in the credit union and you share the profits from it too. Um, there's a really interesting um, initiative, a Catholic initiative called the Economy of Communion, um, which is associated with uh, a Catholic group called Focolare, um, and I know there are Focolari people at Fordham. Uh, I, know them, I know them quite well. Um, and the economy of communion is basically a network of businesses where they say that you, you divide the profits into different ways. One, you reinvest the profits in the business to make it healthier and stronger. And two, you use some of the profits to give to those in need. And three, you use some of the profits to build a culture of giving and reciprocity. So this is, these are businesses that make profits. So it's not charity, but at the same time, they're able to give a social benefit uh, to, everybody, to everybody else and, and, provides this, and they provide the space for everybody to develop their talents and to contribute in a socially meaningful way. So the civil economy paradigm to sum up it ties profit to ethics and the common good. Um, um, and yeah, uh, I, I, I could go on and on and on about the civil economy paradigm, but I think I'm actually going to stop here, um, stop sharing my screen, and I'm going to use the last uh, five minutes to take your questions and, and, and have an open discussion um, because we've done a lot. We've had a lot of fun this morning. We've done a lot of experiments. We've talked about uh, a lot of things that economics classes don't normally talk about, like psychology, evolutionary biology, neuroscience, um, different approaches to economics. So we've covered a lot of ground, and I think it's time to take a breath and to just have a discussion. So. The, uh, does this resonate? I mean, uh, does this approach resonate? Um, let me get your views. Anybody want to comment on anything? Mm -hmm. Alexi. Uh, it definitely does resonate. I mean, 
one thing that you learn right in in the first sort of lessons of, of microeconomics um, is you know the market has externalities and mm -hmm. but you can't really do anything about that or maybe it's it's uh, policymakers who can do something about it. Um, so it does resonate. But I, I would have a question if if there is enough time still. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so what I don't understand still is so traditional economics would say that the way that the market acts, it's always in the most efficient way, meaning mm -hmm. it is always uh, benefiting society the most, meaning mm -hmm. um, uh, consumer surplus, producer surplus, mm -hmm. uh, no dead weight loss, like all mm -hmm. these things. Mm -hmm. So if we, if we now introduce any legislation or change anything about the market itself, uh, because we believe that, you know, all the things that we talked about so far. Uh, so if, if we sort of actually change the market, how the market works, then don't we risk like, in, like inefficiency? And uh, I'm, I'm just trying to understand how you could counter, counter argue that because at the end of the day, you do uh, risk inefficiency. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just trying to understand that. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with you. I think... You know, the concept of Pareto efficiency, as we defined it, is a very powerful concept. But the problem is, and I would quote, I would answer by quoting Amartya Sen, uh, to repeat what I said about Amartya Sen, that you can have an economy that is Pareto efficient, but also perfectly disgusting. Um, in other words, you have vast amounts of exclusion and a lack of, a lack of proper well-being. Um, it's, it's based on, you know, Pareto efficiency is based on the most efficient use of resources in the sense of um, making sure that you leave nothing on the table when it comes to voluntary trade in the marketplace. So, it's, so it is powerful. I won't deny that, but it's also very limiting. And it has really nothing to say about this kind, especially about the civil economy paradigm. Um, I, I think it has nothing to say about how you build up uh, social trust and cohesion. Because if you are trying to be Pareto efficient and maximize your surplus, um, you will cheat at the various economic games because you're trying to get the maximum for yourself. Um, there's no real concept of sharing. The idea is um, it's the invisible hand idea that if you try to maximize your own utility or your own profit, you get a socially beneficial outcome. But it turns out that that's not the case and it's not the case because you often you also get outcome you get outcomes that are non-cooperative and uh like for example i mean the, the classic example you mentioned externality the classic example is pollution right you get an example where it's it's socially cooperative to basically clamp down on pollution but nobody wants to do it because you don't trust the other person is going to stop polluting so i'm not going to stop polluting um everybody should pay their taxes. But if I know this billionaire is only paying a tiny proportion of his wealth in taxes, well, why should I pay my taxes? That's just not fair. So there's all kinds of examples where uh, this can go wrong. Whereas if you have a kind of a civil economy paradigm, uh, if your starting motivation is less that I care about my self-interest and more I care about the well-being of the person on the other side of the transaction, I think you can get to different places. Well, I take your point, Alexios. I think Pareto efficiency is a powerful concept that shouldn't be too easily thrown out. Uh, Jim Stoner, you had your hand raised. Yeah, I was going to comment on something else in Will, but first let me follow Alexi's comment about efficiency. I think it's a very common argument for the markets. And in the definition of efficiency that is popular, or one of the definitions of efficiency. However, it very rarely addresses the question of effectiveness. I think if you look at any system, you have to look both at efficiency and effectiveness. And to argue the market, unregulated markets are effective, uh, is very hard to make, I think. Yeah. And so I would always keep those two effective and efficiency issues in front of me because that's what we, we talk about that in management all the time i think that's um, a, that's and a i very think nice, tony yeah. you were talking about you were talking about effective to also as well as efficiency just now 
But I, yes. I would pull those two on the table very loudly. Let me go, let me go on the second one, if I can. You want, you want to come back, Tony, right away? I was going I go to say, I, I, like, I, like your, I like your choice of language. I think that's an, the distinction between efficiency and effectiveness is nice. I like that. I agree with you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Well, I shall let you agree. <laughs> yeah. So, no, thank um, you. Thank you for is, that. Yeah. The other one is you're speaking. I was thinking, we're at Fordham. A lot of our students in, the, in graduate school in the business program are working in financial institutions. Yes. And a lot of them are pretty unhappy. And I think that a big hunk of the issue in our corporations now is that the purpose of so many of our corporations is purely to make money. Yeah. It's most clear, perhaps, in the financial services industry, which is just, just almost criminal the way it's run mm -hmm. to a large extent. Um, and our students are, are quite unhappy. So I think a moderating variable that we really want to look at in terms of uh, effectiveness of organizations and, and careers and lives is the purpose of the organization. And business schools themselves are now starting to grapple with what are they really teaching us purpose? And to a large yeah. extent, we're teaching purposes to make as much money as possible for the company. And that turns out to be a pretty hollow feeling if you are working in those kinds of organizations. And yeah. I think a lot of our, grad, our students graduate with a pretty lack of feeling for what they what they're doing, that there's yeah. no there's very little purpose in our life, yeah. in in organizational lives. I think that's right. I think that's a hundred percent right. And I think that to go back to the civil economy paradigm, uh, if you if you draw that out more into what you were saying, Jim, um, the purpose of a business there is not just to make money or maximize profits, like it would be in neoclassical Smithian economics, but it's it's to be responsible to as many share stakeholders as possible, like your workers, your consumers, your suppliers, society at large, the environment. Um, you know, this is, these are not just optional add-ons. These should be essential to what a business is trying to do because that's how you build. That's how you build well-being and build trust and social capital in society. Okay, it's 11.15, so the class is over. Uh, your assignment is due on Monday at uh, noon. Uh, have a lot of fun with that. By the way, I might drop it in. There was um, just uh, quickly before I go on the universal basic income, uh, none other than Pope Francis has weighed in supporting universal basic income. And I found, I haven't listened to it, but there was a webinar, I believe at Oxford University last week discussing Pope Francis's um, uh, analysis of uh, a universal basic income and weighing the pros and cons. Uh, if I can find it, I'll drop it in the blackboard. You might find just you might find it useful to listen to it uh, since we've talked so much about Catholic social teaching. Um, I'll let you go. Uh, as always, I'll stay on since it's Friday. I'll stay on if any students want to stick around and ask me questions. I'm happy to do that. Otherwise, I wish you all a very happy and uh, flourishing and uh, socially relational weekend. Uh, as much as we can do in these awful COVID times. Okay, take care, everybody. I'll stick around if anybody has any questions. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. So the, um, the first essay is due Monday by noon? Yes. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. And just shoot, shoot me an email if you have any questions. Yeah, yeah. Okay. In my next class, I, I'm, I have a discussion uh, in business ethics, and I have to talk about uh, Milton Friedman's social responsibility. Uh, uh, I just want to know if you guys had anything uh, I, I could add to that discussion, if you have any strong opinions. Oh, I, have, I, I, I definitely have strong opinions <laughs> that Friedman is a high thousand percent wrong. Um, I think that, you know... Um, if, you know, he, he, he basically argued that the only, the only social role of business is to maximize profits because business doesn't really know enough about what does business know about the environment or politics or something like that. But if you, if we are social, cre I would argue that if, if we are truly uh, what, what human nature says we are, uh, social and relational beings, then that has to manifest in, the, in, in all aspects of economic life, including in business. Therefore, we have to support the common good and therefore we have to be more responsible to a wider variety of, of shareholders. 
Um, you know what's very good on this? Um, Pope Benedict's encyclical, Caritas and Veritate. Um, you can um, impress your professor by quoting Pope Benedict uh, on that. But Pope Benedict has some quote, has some, you can just Google it. It's called Caritas and Veritate. It's long, so I wouldn't read the whole thing, but you can, but he talks a lot. He talks about uh, the, the wider responsibility of business outside to a narrow, um, narrow uh, shareholders um, and why that's, why that is a part of the whole uh, ethical mooring of the business world. Yeah. But then to the question, kind of like what, why does the business have like the, um, you know, who are they to make that impact over giving that money to shareholders? You know, like, I, I know this professor is going to grill me. I, I got to give a, a good argument. <laughs> so the professor is actually arguing in favor of share of shareholder primacy. Um, I, I don't, I think it's more just to, to get our opinions out of it really kind of, probing our understanding of the reading maybe um can, J- uh, james and jim actually teach <laughs> management so maybe they can help you with this go ahead okay. james i i just had a quick comment which was based on your lecture today which is the whole idea of of the primacy of of the shareholder and the company it is is exactly that microcosm that that is not it, it's the exact opposite of universality it's